Okay, it's 8 o'clock. We're going to get started. Welcome to Cornea Grand Rounds. Our first presentation is by our Cornea Fellow, Dr. Betts. Thanks. Okay. Let's go back. So we have a case, hopefully it's interesting for uh, everyone here, um, that Dr. Mithlin and I saw a couple weeks ago. So we had a lady came in, uh, her main complaint was she had pain when she blinked her eye. She was 66, had this foreign body sensation for about two months when she blinked. Um, complained of photophobia and tearing, kind of you know low grade pain, and this was her fourth opinion. She'd been all over, she's from Idaho, but she'd been to Colorado and Montana and all over. Um, so she was kind of frustrated. Um, history, past octo history was significant for LASIK. She had a hyperopic correction about 15 years ago. But um, as you can see, she wasn't out of glasses for very long. Um, at some point, five years ago, she had some chronic irritation. And there's kind of a, you know, we weren't sure of the diagnosis, but she said she'd been told she had a viral infection and then uh, staph keratitis at the same time. And so she said her symptoms improved with some kind of drops, but she wasn't sure what it was. Um, past medical history, she has autonomic neuropathy, mainly like peripheral neuropathy in her hands and feet, and then some GI symptoms. Takes Anax and Lysinopril, you know, kind of diabetes, heart disease, and her family history. She's single and not a smoker. Um, her examination, visual acuity in the right and left eye were pretty good. You can see she has a hyperopic uh, refraction. And then everything else is pretty normal. I'll show you a slid lamp photo of her left uh, anterior segment, but everything else is pretty unremarkable. You can see her LASIK flap in her right eye, mild cataract. Um, but you can see here, this is a a uh, still lamp photo of her left eye, and kind of attention is drawn to this well-circumscribed area of whitening in the cornea. Um, this spot here was about 1.5 millimeters in diameter. It was slightly elevated, um, had like a little bit of, you know, pigment. Maybe this was from uh, her makeup. But you can see it, it caused some shadowing, so it does block light a little bit. And then I have uh, some more photos here. It's kind of a closer up view. You can, you can see here. Um, doesn't appear that there's any, you know, surrounding haze or edema. Um, doesn't look really that, inf it doesn't look infected. Um, What's the depth? The depth, so it looked, you know, it was pretty, fairly anterior, kind of anterior stroma. Um, and also incorporated the epithelium too. Um, just one more photo, not, not super great, but um, you can kind of see it there. And we got anterior segment OCT because we wanted to see what layers of the cornea this was uh, including. And so I have the single shot here. You can see your attention is drawn to the center of the image where you have this hyperreflectivity in the anterior stroma and epithelium. You can kind of appreciate if I can convince you here that there's a LASIK flap and maybe it gets a little thicker right here. Maybe there's some inflammation, but then it thins out. And so, um, and there's a lot of shadowing into the posterior cornea. Uh, we felt that this was kind of supporting evidence that there was involvement of the uh, stromal of uh, the anterior stromal flap from LASIK. Um, so we thought, well, we should scrape it and see what it is. And and you know, you can see my medical term, mushy epithelium. It was just kind of ratty and and came off really easy. And then there's some mild calcification underneath, but didn't appear there was active epithelial ingrowth that we could see, kind of a classic nest of cells or anything like that. Um, but we, we gave her a working diagnosis of like a chronic LASIK flap necrosis, um, possibly due to some focal epithelial growth. There are some case reports of that that I'll um, kind of discuss a little bit. Um, but it's something that's pretty uncommon. More commonly, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about LASIK flap necrosis in general, but usually it, it occurs in the uh, early postoperative period. The nice thing about LASIK is we've created this nice new potential space for bad things to happen. Um, and lots of good things happen too, but Rarely you can get these bad things that cause, can cause LASIK flap necrosis. Um, so I'll go through these briefly and then talk about what we thought was going on with our patient. So infectious keratitis, typically it occurs kind of within the first two to three days postoperatively, but up to two weeks. Um, the early form is typically strep or staph species, um, and you kind of treat them classically by lifting up the flap and irrigating with broad spectrum antibiotics and then treating with fortified antibiotics. Um, there's, there, were some, there was an outbreak years ago of rare atypical mycobacterium. That's kind of a chronic smoldering infection. 
um, and you kind of treat it you know, the same way except you use amikacin instead. Uh, predisposing risk factors include blepharitis, um, poor hygiene, contaminated instruments. You can also get fungal infections, but those are pretty uh, rare. Um, we actually had a case here. This wasn't our case, but the patient came in. This was back in 2009. But you can see here there's diffuse corneal haze. There's uh, kind of this multifocal infiltrate. Um, I have a slit lamp uh, photo of this. And you can appreciate right in the center there's some thinning. Most of the infiltrate's kind of located where the flap interface is. But um, one thing that's important to differentiate between infectious keratitis and another entity I'm going to talk about is that infectious keratitis can spread beyond the the flap itself, the flap interface. It can go into the posterior stroma and into the flap itself. Um, this patient ended up getting better and she's actually getting cataract surgery in a couple weeks. The other thing that's kind of, you have to differentiate to, from infectious keratitis is uh, diffuse laminar keratitis. It's this non-specific white blood infiltrate in the flap interface and it's usually just uh, in that area. It usually doesn't spread into the flap itself or into the posterior stroma. It's typically seen earlier, so like one day after surgery. And there are four stages, and I don't have pictures of all of them, but it's basically you know, going from, from pretty mild case to something that's really bad, like flap necrosis. There was a case of flap necrosis that was referred to us a couple years ago, and this was when it was resolving. DLK is kind of classically called like the Sands of Sahara because you get this kind of linear pattern. It looks like maybe you know, the rolling sand hills that you'd see in sand dunes. Um, but you can appreciate here that centrally um, you have this white blood cell infiltrate, maybe a little bit of edema, and then you can kind of see that maybe when you get to the center here, the flap has thinned some. And this patient had stage four DLK, and so they had flap necrosis. And the treatment for DLK is aggressive corticosteroid use. First you start topically, then you do systemic, and then lifting the flap and irrigating is another thing that people have recommended also. Um, and then that's what I said. Epithelial ingrowth is the other thing that can cause LASIK flap necrosis. It's, the numbers are kind of all over the place, but in general, BCSC says that 3% of eyes can get epithelial ingrowth af after LASIK. It's more common with a microkeratome blade for cutting the LASIK flap than a femtosecond uh, flap creation. More common hyperopic correction, which our patient had, LASIK after RK, and epithelial defects after surgery. Um, it generally is kind of, this it has a pretty classic appearance. You get these nests of epithelial cells in the flap interface. Typically it's peripheral, so the peripheral flap, but you can get kind of focal central uh, nests, which are less common. Here's another case, and you can really appreciate, there's the edge of the LASIK flap, and you can appreciate all these nests of epithelial cells in the periphery. Most of the time they stay there and they're asymptomatic and you can just observe them, um, but if they get into the visual axis, then you have to lift up the flap and scrape the cornea. So there's kind of some theories why epithelial ingrowth would cause a flap melt. Um, some of the original theories were that maybe the epithelial ingrowth blocked uh, aqueous diffusion to the stroma, and so you get like this focal necrosis from the stroma not getting enough nutrition. And then also we know that epithelial cells release inflammatory cytokines and they can cause like a focal inflammation. Um, and our, our theory in our patient was maybe she had some small nest of epithelial cells that over time just kind of smoldered and caused this slowly progressing uh, flap necrosis. And that's why maybe had that nice, well circumscribed circular uh, um, appearance because there might have just been a little bit of a cell and it kind of spread out and you get diffusion, you look at, like an even diffusion of inflammatory cytokines causing that chronic smoldering necrosis. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can manage this. I mentioned you can lift up the flap and scrape it. Some more exotic things that have been tried and may or may not work is using a la YAG laser to, if you have a focal uh, ingrowth area, you can zap it. But there are a couple case reports where people zapped it and they cause a buttonhole in the LASIK flap and then you get more epithelial ingrowth. So um, it's not really recommended, but I put it on there for historical purposes. Also more extreme things after you've tried to lift the flap and scrape all the epithelial cells and then you've sutured the flap. If that doesn't help or if you glued the flap, you can do PTK or you can truncate the flap and then do PRK on top of it to try to ablate all the epithelial cells and give someone a decent correction. And then people have tried other things like mitomycin C to um, stop fibroblast growth. And some of these things have worked great in some reports and other reports they haven't worked that well. Um, so our patient, you know, 
we had kind of a lot of management considerations. She had, she was 20, 25 corrected, you know, we didn't want to be super aggressive and uh, cause her vision to go down. And the melt was outside the visual axis and that kind of plays into good visual acuity. She also had this, you know, possible history of a zo or of simple, herpes simplex. And so we didn't know if that was playing a role. And like I said, we were wondering how aggressive we should be. So Dr. Miffin scraped it. And then uh, just for kind of diagnostic purposes, we decided to go with a bandaged contact lens. Um, our thought was maybe bandaged contact lens, if it was, especially if it was kind of a little tighter fitting, it could induce some hypoxia and cause some scarring in that area of necrosis. And then she'd have a nice scar there and she wouldn't have the irritation anymore. Other things that we considered were using tissue glues you can use to seal, other fibrin <coughs> glues. Sealants like Rasher have been um, described in literature recently for kind of stopping epithelial ingrowth. And then you can also use cyanoacrylate glue too and just put a bandaged contact lens on top. Uh, more extreme things, which we didn't really consider in her, you can actually amputate a flap and you can do a lamellar transplant. And sometimes people with trephine outside of the, the, where the flap was originally created and then do like a really thin lamellar dissection and then um, you can use a femtosecond laser to do a, create a lamellar flap out of a donor cornea. Um, but like I said, we were conservative. So we put her on antibiotics until she went back to Idaho in a couple weeks and was gonna see her um, local ophthalmologist and he removed it. Um, and then we put her on a prednisone taper and covered her with uh, antiviral during that time. I talked to the patient last night and it's been a month since we saw her. And she said she feels great when the contact's in, but when they took it out, her eye was irritated, so her ophthalmologist put it back in and kind of kept her on the same protocol here. And uh, my impression from talking to her is that if it wasn't better in a month or two, we were going to be seeing her again just to talk about other management considerations because she's pretty irritated and it's been bothering her for a long time. Um, so take home points, this is a weird, unusual case, like chronic necrosis of a LASIK flap is very, very rare. Um, it's important kind of for residents and just in general to differentiate this diffuse laminar keratitis from infectious keratitis because the treatment's a lot different. And so you can see where the inflammation is. If it's just localized to the uh, interface of the flap itself, it's probably DLK, especially if it just showed up in the first day after surgery. But if they have pain, photophobia, and it looks, it looks angry, then you should treat prophylactically with antibiotics. And then epithelial growth, the vast majority of time can be uh, observed. Um, I know, we, you know, we always have LASIK study going on. In our last study, I think in the last year, we had one patient who had some ingrowth, but it was just in the periphery, and we just watched it, and her vis the visual acuity of the patient was really good. Um, and so I can take any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, so be more aggressive. I think we'll probably go the, the, the glue route. We've, we talked about doing Rasher because it's easy, but you know this is a chronic smoldering problem. Rasher sealant only lasts about a week, and so it may not be long enough. And we've, we have a really, the, the cyanoacrylate glue that we use here is pretty mild. Even if your contact lens comes out, it doesn't, even, it doesn't really irritate an eye. And so we thought about doing that and just letting it sit there until it gets better. We, we did discuss that you know extreme uh, lamellar transplant, but I think because her visual acuity is good, we'd like to avoid doing something extreme like that. And I think hopefully a poor fitting contact lens covered by antibiotics will help her scar down. I think one other possibility is just putting a little small amniotic membrane patch in that area to manage contact lens and that may, that may work too. Dr. Orson White, long ago, was gluing some contact lenses on babies who were born with congenital cataracts, trying to give them some vision before they started their nystagmus. And the epithelium would go right between the contact lens and the cornea. It, it doesn't seem to be an epithelial barrier. It wasn't then in that situation, mm -hmm. so just a word of caution on that. Okay. I'm sure it could. Yeah, and of course, we have to always think of NSAIDs too. NSAIDs are a, a really, a, I would say, inappropriately prescribed thing that you always need to think about. It's really prevalent in the ER uh, you know, setting, and uh, you know, not 
typically would cause something that looks like this, which is very focal, but certainly I think about anesthetic use and NSAIDs both. Good point. Thank you.